security, right? Um, if we follow the logic of the narrative that I describe in knocking on labor's door, then we can see that today's working class and class struggles in a very different light. We can more clearly see members of a diversified working class waging a blue collar battle around issues of security and prosperity for themselves, their families and their communities, both in the 1970s and today. The tools, the, the weapons, if you will, in this battle um, have changed, but the battle itself is remarkably sim similar. Now, I want to be clear. I do think we need to figure out what happened uh, or is happening with Joe the plumber, right? Why and when do uh, white working class men go to the right? And when do they not, right? Because not all of them do. Uh, and, um, you know, <laughs> so I think we do need further study on that question. My focus this week, though, is in, in these two discussions, is more on how the entire US working class is evolving and has been evolving for the last 50 to 60 years, and when and how working people have contested for power within a transforming capitalism. OK, so today I'm going to talk about how that contest played out in the 1970s. And then tomorrow, I'll talk about where I think the US workers movement is headed today. And I, I am now going to seamlessly share my screen, but I'm not sure that, am I already a co-host? Can I just share my screen? Let's try it. You are. Uh, I am, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see, okay. Share, and then I need to start this, start from the beginning. Let's go back one. Okay, good. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about knocking on labor's door, uh, union organizing in the 1970s and the roots of a new economic divide. Um, and, you know, I when I talk about the book, I often find that people uh, are ready to skip ahead to the, to the end of the second lecture. They wanna talk about like now, like how do people build power now, right? In order to understand how workers got to their present crisis, you have to understand what happened in the 1970s. Uh, the standard narrative does not serve to help us see that blue collar battle that workers wage. So we're gonna start there and uncover how working people fought for power uh, and they fought and lost really in the 1970s. Um, and this, how this decade set the stage for workers' current struggles. Okay. So let's see, yes. Historians are clear that the 1970s were pivotal years. At the beginning of the decade, things were looking really good for workers. Real incomes had roughly doubled since the 1940s. Income inequality was low and about a quarter of workers were in unions. But then things started to change. There's more global competition. And US companies began to see that their rate of profit was slowing. There'd been slowdowns before, but this was different. Uh, the 1970s was the birth of what I call the new economic divide uh, that we're still living with today. Wages stopped rising along with productivity. Working people did not share in the later recoveries. Union membership took a sharp turn downward. By the mid 1980s, private sector union density would be cut nearly in half to 14%. Today, union density is at a historic low in the private sector. It's about 6.3%, about the same level as in 1900. Okay, so when explaining labor's decline in the pivotal 1970s, many academics and journalists place the blame squarely on what they portray as bureaucratic unions, which they say were complacent, and also on working people who they say lost interest in organized labor. Uh, so here's a direct quote from a textbook. No great organizing drives were undertaken by major national unions or the AFL-CIO itself for decades. One historian even claims that the 1970s were, quote, the last days of the working. But this didn't seem right to me because 
like Don said, I had, I've been an organizer. I organized unions throughout the South with the clothing and textile workers union uh, in the nineties. And I'm gonna actually talk about some of those experiences in tomorrow's lecture. Um, I knew that working class people were very active and that they wanted unions. So I started to take a closer look at the numbers. And I didn't just count yes votes uh, when I started to research National Labor Relations Board elections. Instead, I counted all the people who tried to form unions, whether they won or not. And that decision is at the core of the book and allows me to tell a different story than what most historians tell. It turns out that roughly 5 million workers voted in board elections in the 1970s, half a million a year, the same pace as in labor's heyday in the 1950s and 60s. What you're looking at here is the number of voters in union elections from 1949 to 1999. And I would draw your attention to that middle chunk. Um, can I, I wonder if I can, yeah, like this section, this section. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's fairly steady in these years. And meanwhile, there's another 3 million public sector workers who don't even show up in this chart who are organizing right here in the 1970s. So really it should be like higher up here. Um, in fact, uh, let's see. So there's a wave of millions of working people who came knocking on labor's door in the 1970s. They tried to organize unions in the private sector, including throughout the South. And many of the people leading these drives were women and people of color who were just entering the workforce. They had long been excluded from the nation's best jobs and from many of the nation's unions, but they had won new access through the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This is far from the last days of the working class. These are the first days of a transformed, diversified and newly activated working class. You know, for many years, scholars talked about how the rights consciousness of the 1960s and 70s eclipsed ideas about class and labor, and that the labor movement missed the boat on joining the rights-based movements. But this interpretation of labor is very narrowly framed. Ironically, it centers white men as the proper representation of labor and didn't see the millions of people of, of people of color the, and women who are outside unions and who are trying to get in. In fact, as these women, these people of color, many of them young people, as they poured into these newly opened jobs, they demanded unions. They didn't just want a job, they wanted a good job. So they are workers like Henry Davison who left his hometown in Monroe, Louisiana in 1965 because he couldn't find anyone willing to hire a black man at a decent wage. He returned home in 1976 and landed a job at a GM plant uh, in Louisiana, and he organized it. He's pictured here with his family on his left and his coworkers on the right. There are lots of surprising union victories in this decade. Workers at the Midwest Stock Exchange unionized, as did thousands of hospital workers. Workers at the first foreign auto transplant, a VW plant in Pennsylvania organized. When workers at Yosemite Park wanted a union, board agents rode out to their remote work sites on horseback with ballot boxes strapped to the horse's side uh, and they won. Security guards who worked for Pinkerton, the notorious strike breaking firm won a union in the 1970s. So board statistics, of course, don't tell us anything about the race and gender of these workers. Uh, for that, I did a lot of interviews, looked at polling, news accounts, union records, actually also anti-union attorneys records. Women were key. They powered this new wave. Women poured into the nation's workplaces in the 1970s. There were 12 million more women working for wages by the end of the decade, and many joined unions. In 1960, only 18% of union members were women. By 1984, that figure was 34%. Black workers were by far the most likely workers to say that they wanted a union. Now, it's important to recognize that many unions were still reluctant to accept black members. Unions were very slow to open up staff and leadership positions to black workers, workers of color in general, to women. Many black workers had to file EEOC charges to win equal access. 
but black workers wanted unions. A full 70% of African-American blue collar workers said that they would form a union if given a chance. The AFL-CIO estimated that during this period, one out of every three new union members was African-American. Hispanic workers are more likely than the general population to be in a union. This image is from the Farah clothing campaign and boycott in Texas. 3,000 uh, native, mostly native born Hispanic workers, women mostly, walked out demanding union recognition in a two year long strike. There was a big consumer boycott and they eventually brought a very reluctant management to the table. The immigrant population was still relatively low in the 1970s, but the Hart Seller Act of 1965 changed the rules on immigration and helped set the stage for large scale immigration in the final two decades, really three decades of the century. Um, but uh, big urban areas like New York and LA were destinations for immigrants, including in the 70s. And many of these workers organized at auto, garments, furniture. Uh, Chinese immigrants in New York City uh, who worked in garment shops organized. 20,000 took to the streets in a major strike in 1982. Um, the book features four case studies that I chose in part because they countered specific aspects of the standard historical narrative. And I'm gonna just walk you through them and I would be happy to answer questions or describe more in depth uh, during the Q&A. So the standard narrative says that workers were losing interest in unions in this time, that they were turned off by the union bureaucracy. According to the standard narrative, unions missed the boat on the new energy of the civil rights and women's movements. Well, actually, when you get down to the workplace level, labor and civil rights struggles were deeply intertwined in people's lives. Uh, so the first case study features a union organizing victory at Newport News Shipyard in Virginia, where a group of four black men first filed charges through civil rights law to gain access to good jobs in the yard in the mid 1960s. And they won two landmark EEOC cases in 1966 and in 1970. By the late 1970s, these same African-American men, including Oscar Pretlow and Ellis Cofield, who are pictured here, they turned to the United Steelworkers of America when those laws still weren't enough to help them win good pay and security. They sparked a union campaign and a board election among 19,000 workers, which was the largest ever in the South, the largest in the 1970s. Um, you know, workers didn't choose between civil and labor rights. They used both in tandem. It's when you look at it from Oscar Pretlow's perspective, it makes no sense to talk about a dichotomy of labor rights and civil rights. You know, it's he he used whatever tools he could to advance, uh, and really both those struggles were embodied in his life. So that dichotomy just doesn't make sense when <laughs> you look at it from an actual person's life. Um. When workers at Newport News couldn't get a contract, they struck for 82 days. And part of that was a wildcat strike, which prompted a violent police reaction. Um, you know, I, this photo, I think, illustrates that uh, white men uh, also joined in cross race class alliances. This, this guy is a Newport News striker. Uh, you know, at Newport News, workers took inspiration from the civil and women's rights movements. The, their rights consciousness fed the union fires, and that was true also for some white men. Okay, but perhaps Newport News was an outlier, right? Navy ships, after all, had to be built in the U.S. Maybe these workers, it was different for them. Maybe they could organize because they were somehow outside the pressures of globalization. Well, another piece of the standard narrative for labor's decline is that as capitalism globalized, workers automatically and naturally just lost power. Well, actually, globalization is neither neutral nor natural. It is created by human actors um, and companies routinely use globalization as a weapon to keep workers from organizing. So in the second case study, 
I examined two elections in another Southern industrial setting, Cannon Mills in Kannapolis, North Carolina. For years, African-American workers were excluded from textile plants, yet they began organizing unions as soon as they started coming into the mills in the, in the 70s. Uh, in the election, uh, there was a labor board election in 1974, and globalization hadn't really kicked in that much in the textile in industry at that point. Black workers nearly helped bring in a union. Um, the company fought the workers' organizing efforts, but the campaign did not include globalization and imports among the issues. This leaflet is from the 1974 campaign, and that guy sitting there is supposed to be the Northern Union boss, and those are the union dues, uh, you know. So that was, you know, they they talked about the union as the outsider, uh, but it wasn't about imports. But by the second election in 1985, the textile industry was in the throes of globalization and the company used a globalizing economy as a threat to keep workers from unionizing. Imports was the big theme. Even though more African-American workers than ever before uh, were in the plant and many experts predicted, oh, well, this time the union's definitely gonna win. In fact, the company's threats worked. Even though over half the workers had indicated they wanted a union by signing a union card, when it came down to the time of the vote by the end of the campaign, the union was defeated two to one. Uh, globalization is shaped by people who make real-time decisions. The employer used a globalizing economy as a threat to keep those workers from forming a union. Okay, but both of Newport News and Cannon Mills are industrial set. Much of the job market in the 1970s and beyond has shifted to retail, to service. Another part of the standard narrative is unions declined because unions didn't do enough to organize in retail and service. Well, actually, retail and service workers did try to form unions, but they faced a, fall, a wall of resistance from their employers. Labor board records show that the number of retail workers voting in labor board elections in the 1970s was up 28% compared to the previous decade. So to get at that sector, the retail sector, my third case study is on the Woodward and Lothrop department store or Woody's, which is a DC based department store, or it was, and the workers there formed a union with local 400 of the United Food and Commercial Workers. It was a very diverse group, majority female, young, many, many women of color. It was Washington, D.C.'s largest NLRB election in history. And the workers in Washington, D.C. at Macy's today have a union because it's the legacy union of, of what this group did. Um, and then in the fourth case study, I look at the service sector and feature nine to five clerical workers in Boston who built off momentum from the women's rights movement to help build a new kind of organization outside the broken uh, labor board system and outside collective bargaining. Um, and they formed SEIU, Local 925 as a sister organization. Uh, I call them the four mothers of alt labor which is a term for the next generation of worker organizations that don't rely on collective bargaining like workers' centers. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, okay, so what happened, right? I'm telling you uh, all these workers, they wanted unions, they organized. And what happened, right? Why didn't the labor movement grow? Well, there's lot, there are lots of reasons for this. Uh, you know, globalization and technological change certainly mattered. But the fact that workers could not freely form unions also fed union decline and the nation's new economic divide. What I discovered is that unions were organizing and people wanted unions. What declined was workers' ability to win those unions. So just many of you already know this, but a reminder of the rather onerous process for forming a union through the National Labor Relations Board process in, the, in this country. Okay, if workers want a union, first, 30% of them have to sign union cards, uh, like those pictured here. These are the union cards from the Newport News campaign. Usually the organizers wait until half have signed a union card. You, then you take all these cards down to the labor board 
uh, and you have to wait eight to 12 weeks for an election. And during this time, the employer has free access to hold meetings, to hold, to campaign against the union. The union has no access inside the workplace. The vast majority of employers fight the effort. About a third fire workers half threatened to shut down, half threatened to cut wages and benefits. Only once workers have gone through this fire, through this process, and still voted for a union, uh, is their employer required to sit down and negotiate a collective bargaining agreement that covers wages, health care, et cetera. Um, while employers in this country have never been thrilled to have a union, they dramatically increased their resistance uh, to unions in the 1970s. They did so in large part because they faced a crisis of profit in a newly globalized and financialized capitalism. Labor costs were something that they could more easily control. Um, as Douglas Souter put it, he was co-founder of the Business Roundtable. People began looking for ways to economize and found out they'd given it away in the contract. Employers began to shut the door on new union organizing and three things changed on this front. First, employers became far more willing to bend and break the law. The number of unfair labor practice charges against employers doubled in this decade, as did the number of illegal firings. What you're looking at here is the unfair labor practice charges against employers from the 1950s through the 1990s. And you see this dramatic rise in the 1970s, the 80s. Second, even unionized employers at the core of the economy, companies like GM, US Steel, Goodrich, began to viciously fight their workers' efforts to unionize. I looked at these unfair labor practices by sector, so we've got manufacturing, retail, and service, and it turns out that by the 1970s, workers in manufacturing were more likely to face employer lawbreaking than those in retail and service. Um, and you know that's it's significant because that was those were the areas where most of the union members were already. Um, so they were really turning on unions. Third, employers began to rely much more heavily on union busters who closely advised employers on how to thwart unionizing attempts, including educating managers on the low costs of skirting and breaking the law. They bred fear about new levels of women and people of color in the workforce, and they used this diverse workforce to gen up business. So for instance, Martin J. Levitt spelled out in Confessions of a Union Buster how he and his employer, 3M, capitalized on the wave of organizing among Black women. 3M developed training tactics to, quote, according to Levitt, awaken within the mostly white supervisor corps a hatred of Blacks, contempt for women, mistrust of the poor, end quote. So the historians and pundits have been unclear about whether uh, women and people of color were organizing. The employers were very clear that they were organizing, right? And their efforts uh, to block this organizing was extremely effective. While workers won roughly 80% of union elections in the 1940s, by the late 1970s, they won less than half. I think it's important, uh, crucial even, to pause here and ask why, right? Why did employers fight so hard to keep workers from forming unions, especially at this point? After all, while US employers had long resisted unions, their anti-union efforts dramatically escalated in this decade. Uh, and I think unpacking this question helps us uh, get to workers' present crisis and, and leads us to tomorrow's lecture. Employers had a huge incentive to resist union organizing because of the particular role that collective bargaining plays within the US's employer-centric social welfare system. Okay, so what do I mean by that? 
In the US, much of our social safety net, our pensions, our health care, even like a, a base living wage, all of this uh, comes through our employers. And this employer provided social welfare system developed after World War II, different in many other countries where the social safety net is either provided universally to all citizens or where employers are required to provide social benefits. The US never really required employers to provide these social benefits uh, as did other countries. Instead, we required employers to bargain over those social benefits with workers who had jumped through all those hoops that it took to form a union in this country. Our system thus relies on unions and collective bargaining to do the kind of redistribution and social safety net work that governments do elsewhere. When the employers faced a crisis of profit in the 1970s, they wanted out of those social welfare obligations. The best way out, avoid the one entity that can legally force you to play that role, which is a union through collective bargaining. When employers attacked union organizing in the 1970s, they did more than bust unions. They busted really a cornerstone of the US's employer provided social compact. Um, and in fact, employers assault on unions was part of their overall attack on the entire employment relationship. This is when they began hiring more part-time workers, contractors, workers without benefits. Eventually this has evolved into today's gig economy. Over the last several decades, we've seen a giant shift in how our economy works and it started in the 70s and resisting workers union organizing was part of this shift. And in tomorrow's lecture, I'll expand on this idea of a social compact and explain how part of the working class fight today is building a new social compact that works for everyone. Okay, but for now, we're still in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> and by the er we have made it to the early 1980s and corporations had created such a culture of fear that they had closed the door on new organizing. Uh, there was a downturn to organizing uh, from which we've never really recovered. This is the moment uh, when the wave ends. But before I get to that downturn, let's pause in 1981 when it was not so clear what was gonna happen. Labor did not know what turbulent times lay ahead. On September 19th, 1981, uh, the labor movement staged its largest protest in history, Solidarity Day. And I bet there are people on this call who were part of Solidarity Day. And if so, I hope that you will uh, speak up during the Q&A so we can hear your experience. Historians have generally ignored this march. Uh, a number of textbooks do not even cover it, including labor textbooks. About 400,000 people marched in a protest that was comparable to or larger than the 1963 March on Washington. Participants rode in on 3,000 chartered buses, a dozen specially chartered Amtrak trains and AFL-CIO subsidized the Metro that day. People didn't fly because it was during the air traffic controller strike. So that's why they especially had all these trains. Um, I spent a fair amount, amount of time looking at the pictures from this event and the group is far more diverse than it would have been even 20 years before. The Civil Rights Act transformed not only America's workplaces but also the labor movement. But the tide soon turned and not in the direction the marchers had hoped for a number of reasons. There was a steep recession in the early 1980s and job losses were concentrated in the unionized manufacturing and construction sectors. The UAW and the steel workers each lost 400,000 members between 1979 and 1984, about a third of their membership in five years. Reagan, of course, was elected. He fired air traffic controllers, which killed uh, organizing. We, there was also a labor board that was very hostile to organizing. In the face of all of this, and after a decade of increased employer resistance to union organizing, unions began pulling back from organizing. 
While about half a million had tried to form unions each year in the 70s, by 1983, right, so this drop right here, it's down to 165,000. It never again went above a quarter of a million people who were trying to form unions. Last year, it was around maybe 70,000. By the 1990s, when I was organizing, this wave of organizing was over. There was still union organizing, right? And there, were, there was even new forms like Justice for Janitors and Jobs with Justice. But union elections were never again at that 1970s scale. Because our nation's labor laws are so weak, employers effectively closed off the gateway to the most secure social safety net, a union contract. And this helped create the economic insecurity and division of today. So knocking on labor's door uh, shows how historians have been telling an incomplete story about how the US labor movement got into its present crisis. The, the history is not wholly wrong, but it's distorted. Working people did not acquiesce. Their collective struggle didn't just like fade away. A newly diversified working class demanded full access to unions, full access uh, to the employer provided social safety net. They wanted full access to that New Deal order and they demanded it, a massive push for economic equality, for prosperity. They fought and they lost. And fighting and losing is a very different thing than not fighting at all. It's not that the workers didn't want unions. It's that the tools that they had, the labor board elections, had become increasingly weak. The people are fine. It's the tools that are broken. We need to fix labor law. Also, we have to reimagine collective bargaining. And most importantly, perhaps, we have to re envision the entire social compact and the roles that workers' organizations can play in our economy and our society. Collective bargaining uh, was a cornerstone of the employer provided social welfare state in the 20th century. And that system has been weakening since employers started exiting it in the 1970s. Today's workers' organizations are still battling, uh, but they're do not only doing so about the right to enter collective bargaining, uh, they're also fighting for the working class's broader right to security. Um, and that is something we can talk about today as well as tomorrow. Uh, and that's it. So I will stop my screen share. There we go, okay. <laughs> All right, well, that was really great. And I'm sure that people have a lot of questions and we have ample time for asking questions. We, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna to try to end at half past five, that's in central time and half past six uh, Eastern time. Um, and the way we're gonna proceed is that if you look at the bottom, for those of you who aren't familiar with the way this operates, the way we've been doing things, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu. The fourth item from the left says participants. If you click on that, you have the option of raising your hand, which will alert me that you want to raise a, ask a question or make a comment. And at which point we're going to ask you to unmute and to um, activate your camera. If on the other hand, you're someone who's a little shy, um, we'll ask you to, I mean, then you can just use the chat function, which is the thing to the immediate right of that. And you can write out a question or comment and I can read it to Lane and everyone else. Uh, and before I do that, I, I, I'm just going to mention that I was at Solidarity Day um, yeah. <laughs> as a 22-year-old, 20, a 22 an activist, but not a union activist. So I remember it very well, and I did ride the subway. Um, so anyway, <laughs> all right. So um, folks, if you've got questions, please um, raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Again, we're going to ask you to unmute. So the first one I have is from Mike Goodman. Um, if you can uh, activate your camera as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, I had a question. Uh, the first graph you showed about locations where uh, interest uh, was uh, manifested in forming unions, or at least requests were made to the NLRB, I noticed that the number of those applications took a nosedive around 1979. 
So I'm wondering to what extent was the uh, onset of the Reagan administration a factor that was responsible? Then another question I had was to what extent were there after effects or aftershocks from Taft-Hartley, which I know was promulgated in 1947, but I'm wondering if uh, by the late 70s, some of the after effects of, of the restrictions that were imposed by Taft-Hartley, to what extent those were becoming felt and to what extent those impacted upon uh, organization drives. Thanks. I forgot to mention that we are gonna take, uh, our intention was to take these three at a time um, in a cluster and then turn it over to Lane. So if anybody else has a question or comment, now's the opportunity to do that. Um, anybody? Well, if not, we can um, have Lane respond to Mike. And then in the meantime, people can think about questions or comments they'd like to make. Lane, do you want to tackle Mike's questions? Sure. Um, so uh, the 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 first graph that I showed is the number of workers who are who are essentially um, voting in national labor relations board elections, and it's a little hard to tell on that particular graph. But the big drop is actually in 1982. Um, it starts to drop in 1981, but it really plummets in 1982 and 1983 when it goes from about 500,000 a year. Uh, it was still, even in 1979, it was in the 400,000s. And then by 1983, it's down to 165,000 a year coming in that system. Um, so, so that's really when we see that drop. Um, and I, uh, what I see there is Yes, it is part definitely Reagan. It's definitely you know the the fact that the air traffic controller strike chilled organizing, but that also is after a decade of workers have been fighting and fighting you know uh, to come into that system uh, that that unions and workers by the early eighties begin to pull back. Um, I get a little frustrated when people use shorthand uh, when, uh, and this, we hear this all the time in the media of like, well, it was just Reagan. And it, that was the problem. Like that's like, that was, that's what killed the labor movement. And it's, you know, uh, it was not, it wasn't one person. It wasn't one administration. It was um, a, a drawn out battle uh, where employers really, uh, attacked unions and attacked union organizing over uh, you know a 15 year period by the time we we get to the mid 1980s. And then you asked about Taft Hartley, and that's an interesting question. So Taft Hartley, uh, for those who may not be familiar, passed in 1947. It was an amend it amended the 1935 Wagner Act, um, and so Taft Hartley. Uh, weakened labor on many fronts, including, for instance, um, saying that employers had the right to um, reply, to basically to um, speak out at, against the union uh, at work, um, and to hold the what we now call captive audience meetings. Uh, those are the thing. They did a lot of other things to do as well, like um, the so-called right to work, which I hate that term, uh, was one of the things it did. But in terms of organizing, what we see is that while uh, employers gained some of these rights to fight the union and organizing, they didn't really apply it fully and effectively until the 1970s, even though they had that right. Um, and so, um, it is true that they gained that right during Taft Hartley, but there was enough um, uh, enough sort of pushback in the larger culture and society that that most employers didn't fully uh, use it until later. Some did, especially in the South. Okay, well, I have a question, a couple of one question and one comment from two different people, but they wrote it through chat. So the first one is from Alex, Alexis, excuse me. 
who says, what was the makeup of the NLRB during that drop that occurred in the late 70s, early 80s? Um, and secondly, um, and maybe you can, maybe if I can elaborate on that, I mean, to what degree, if you can explain the change in the makeup of the board from the Carter to the Reagan administrations. Um, and then secondly, from William Herbert, it has a comment. He also was at Solidarity Day. He remembers finally hearing Florence re-singing Which Side Are You On with Pete Seeger. Thanks for triggering that memory. And then a question. Does your NLRB data from the 1970s include in your chart the number of workers subject to representation petitions that were withdrawn before an election? And that's two questions. And I'm just curious if there's a third person who wants to quickly jump in. Barry Eidlin does. So Barry, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and if you can activate your camera, um, go ahead. Okay, maybe I'll take one of those. Sorry, I'm outside with my, my kids right now, but uh, Lane, thanks for a great presentation. Hey, Barry. Uh, I, was, I was listening in uh, <laughs> while trying to make sure my kids didn't fall off the swing. Uh, but anyway, I, I obviously buy your argument about the role of, uh, I mean, about the, the fact that, you know, workers still wanted to organize and the uh, employer offensive and stuff like that. But I would like to hear what your response is to the idea that, um, you know, that, that labor found itself in a position where it was difficult, where it was not in a position to fight back because it was, uh, you know, it had expelled its left wing. Uh, and uh, it, it had, uh, you know, was, was, you know, dominated by these sort of conservatives that were able to block efforts at sort of transforming it. You know, I'm, I'm thinking obviously in my own work of the comparison with Canada, where you had a similar upsurge of organizing and working class activity in the 70s, but it was able to actually transform the character of the labor movement itself in a more, you know, fundamental way in terms of, you know, incorporating a more uh, staunch commitment to civil rights, you know, more equity issues and that kind of thing. So I, I yeah. totally get the uh, employer offensive part, but I would like to hear your response to the sort of labor's internal capacity. Okay, well, those are three good questions. So if you wanna tackle those. I'd be happy to. So I'll start with Alexis's question. So. Um, the under Reagan, it was called the, the Dotson board, D-O-T-S-O-N was the guy who, who ran the board. The way the labor board works, uh, some people may be familiar, others may not, is that who, whichever administration is in power basically sets the majority, gets to set the majority of who, of, of control. Um, and so, you know, Reagan definitely appointed conservatives and people who are very um, uh, sympathetic to business. Um, and so it was a, a labor board that was, was you know, not uh, honoring workers' rights, basically, in that time. Um, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Um, I don't, I actually don't remember the specific, if the question was it like, who are the specific people? I don't, I don't remember uh, all this, all the specific people. Um, okay, to William Herbert, uh, I love the Florence Reese story. Um, and I bet we've got a few more people on this call, maybe who are part of Solidarity Day. Um, does the labor board data include uh, the, the, when um, the representation petitions were pulled, no. So I I picked this uh, data. I picked this data set because it gets us before the employer campaign. This is when the workers submit their their cards to the board, and the board says, "Okay, this is a unit of 500 people or whatever," and uh, so we'll we're going to count that unit size. Um, it, it, uh, that's the moment that I'm counting. Uh, the people who rely more on like, uh, who the, the election results, right? How many yes votes, how many no votes, that shows the eight to 12 week employer campaign. And so 
um, it it moves right the 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 support for the union changes over that period so I wanted to get a, a variable that was as close as possible to where people were at the beginning of the campaign now my variable is not perfect because what it represents is the unit sizes so let's say let's say 300 people signed, filed union cards at a at a site that had 500 people the numbers in in that chart are going to be all 500 people are going to be represented that's the size of the unit um, it's because we don't have the data on uh you know how many people at the beginning of the, war, the campaign were actually for um unions uh we just we just know that usually that the employers um and that the work the unions would file when 50 percent of the workers had said that they wanted a union um so that's what that represents um so if if a union pulled the petition in that eight to 12 week period then um then you wouldn't know that uh, they they would still uh, be represented in that. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Um, so Barry, yes, a very interesting question. Um, labor found itself in a position to fight back. So I'll tell you a story of how I came to understand this for, through my research. Um, and again, I think that it's when you get on the ground that the sh that you get a kind of a different view. At Newport News, uh, these this group of African American men were the activists who had filed the civil rights suits, um, and they by 1977 basically uh, still weren't making enough money compared to the other shipyards in the country, and they which they knew had unions. So they they had an independent union, uh, but it was not it was not very good. It was in the company's pocket. So um, the direct the organizing director of the steel workers, a white man, comes in to meet with them, and he says, um, "Okay, you know I don't really think y'all are going to be able to do this. This is a huge uh, shipyard." But fine, if you can get me, you know, 5,000 cards or whatever it was that would represent 30%, uh, then, then we'll talk about, you know, filing a petition. Well, they did it, right? Those workers went out and they organized and they went into night after night after night. They would go to these different communities because the, the workers are spread out sort of all across Tidewater, Virginia, up into North Carolina. They rode in on vans together. Uh, and they organized in community after community every night. They were going out, holding these meetings, you know, starting committees, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, when they get enough cards and they get enough people on the committee, uh, the steel workers say, okay, well, fine, you know, we're, we're going to start a campaign. Here are your two organizers for uh, a 19,000 person shop, two white men. That's who they assigned. <laughs> to this plan. And the workers say, no, you're not going to give us all white organizers. And so the steel workers then sent one black man. So then they had two white men and one black man to organize 19,000 workers, which, you know, anybody who's organized, that's insane. Well, they didn't organize 19,000 workers. The, wor the workers organized it, right? And so um, in that case, you know, what I see is it's it's sort of like a it's a mixed story. The the um, you know we say uh, labor found itself in a position that it couldn't fight back. It was so weakened by getting rid of its conservatives, you know, or getting rid of its radicals, and it was so conservative. Like definitely, I think that you know a lot of the staff members may have been very conservative, but they got pushed by the rank and file and they sometimes went along uh you know sometimes more actively than others i think it's sort of a a, a more mixed story um and so uh too often the story that we tell is just sort of like um well they 
obviously labor declined <laughs> because it you know it threw out its radicals or it was there was this split between uh labor and, and civil rights and we don't really dig in to see like what that looks like at, at the ground level and it's it's a more complicated story when you get there um now there is there's one thing and i would love to see somebody do research on this um there's an idea which i just didn't i couldn't get my hands around because i didn't i didn't have the sources and i didn't have the time um but I found evidence that, you know, labor in the 19, by the 1970s, um, saw in many ways its place within the larger uh, political economy as, as um, maybe containing radicalism, right? Uh, at, but the business, and I found some evidence of this in the National Association of Manufacturers uh, papers, business was no longer re reliant. They didn't see that there was as much of a need for labor to sort of contain con communism as it had in the 1950s and 60s. They were letting go of that. And so there's kind of a shift there where labor was still kind of hanging on to that role. And the business was starting to, um, to let go of it and to think that wasn't as important. Uh, I didn't get into that in the book. I saw a little bit of evidence of it, uh, but it was, it's like a whole nother story that I hope somebody else will pick up. Okay, well, we've got a, a three more. Um, so the first of which is from a former Havens Wright Center visiting scholar, just like Barry Eidlin was, although at that time it was Havens Center. Uh, Rick Fantasia, I'm going to ask you to unmute Rick, and then um, if you can also activate your camera. Let's see, is it working? Hmm. Hello? Yep. Okay, I, I can't get the screen here. Well, in the absence of the camera working, we can hear you, or at least I can. Yeah, all right, yeah, there's no... <laughs> Hi, the, um, I quite enjoyed your presentation, Lane, um, uh, and want to read your book. It was a nice kind of a moment for me to be able to go back and kind of revisit some of the things that I had thought about back in those days. Um, there are a couple of things I would just want to uh, point to and get your reaction to it. The, the first, I mean, most fundamental to me, is um, another issue that was underway. It's the same issue, the union busting, but another form that it took um, was um, a massive wave of decertification elections um, uh, to the extent that from about late 60s where about 200 decertification elections were being called um, by the period that you're looking at, it's seven, eight and 900 per year. Now, each of those decertification elections was a struggle in itself, um, provoked often by employers um, and often following uh, a strike that had been provoked by employers. That is, by the mid 70s, late 70s, employers were provoking strikes to get workers out of the plants or the workplaces and replacing them with strike breakers. Uh, and then uh, because of the Taft-Hartley Act, um, the uh, an election could be held to get rid of those uh, workers who were, uh, had been union members. Huh? Um, there were tens of thousands of those workers, uh, union workers lost, thrown to the wind and completely demoralized after that wave. And that demoralization I've always thought um, has had reverberations in the shift to the right. Huh? Uh, in specific ways, I'm not, I don't have a clear data on it, but I, I I feel quite confident that whole towns, whole factory towns were closed down after that. And that led to uh, decades of uh, demoralization, I think. Um, the other thing that I would, uh, would say, and this is, I guess, related to Barry's point, my friend Barry, um, and that is that um, I would say that the labor leadership in this period that you're writing about, Lane, um, were products, obviously, of the social compact. Uh, they, were, they did not come out of the CIO struggles uh, or 
or some of them had, I think, but many of them hadn't. Um, it was this next generation. Um, and they were, in a sense, groomed by the social compact. Um, uh, radicals had been uh, expelled from most of the unions you know, prior to them. Uh, but I would just suggest that even those few unions who were able to retain a radical leadership, and I'm thinking of, I don't know, UE and the mine mill and smelter workers, and there are a few uh, others, I mean, they weren't able to reverse the employer assault either. It's not as though having radicals would have, you know, uh, embedded power in the working class. It would have given direction. It would have provided a, a much more vibrant social critique. Um, you know, uh, you know, but this was a labor movement that was led by Lane Kirkland, uh, who was a vicious anti-communist and, uh, uh, and a business unionist. Uh, there was no, I, I, it's not as though unions like the UAW uh, um, were gonna elect radical uh, leadership, but there were lots of great struggles within the UAW huh, uh, led by uh, radicals um, to keep the UAW honest. I'm thinking of the Skilled Trades Council, Black Workers Congress and others. Uh, the question to me is always, you know, what happened to them? <laughs> Right? How did these oppositional movements? What happened to them uh, in those unions? And you know, it's probably you know the the same thing that happened to all the large manufacturing industries, and that is you know they just uh, uh, plant closures and other things. Anyway, maybe you could comment on one of these points. <laughs> I'd like to hear it. Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, the next one comes via chat from Logan Smith, who says. Dr. Wyndham, I am currently studying the defeat of a right to work amendment in Missouri in 1978. Missouri's unions and its allies were able to keep this amendment from passing, which was a major victory for labor. Why do you think that the standard narrative will still leave, will still leave out victories by organized labor at this time period? And what do you believe that we can do in order to clear up this narrative and to include the information that has been covered in your text, such as the case studies your book went over. And then one from Mike Slot, who says, I was at Solidarity Day and remember standing almost in the same place during the march for several hours because the crowd was so large and we couldn't move. And his question for you is, the AFL-CIO was criticized for not taking a stronger stance in terms of responding to Reagan's firing of the air traffic controllers. Doesn't this indicate that a significant part of the problem was the failure of the labor movement to respond more proactively and in a progressive way to the emerging anti-union trends? So those are the three questions. And if for others, if you wanna think about questions or comments you'd like to make in the meantime, please do so. Great. <laughs> Um, so Rick, uh, I'll start with you. I am a huge fan of your work um, and it's a thrill to have you uh, on the call today. I was not so long ago on an um, event with Kim Voss and I, it was a thrill also to meet her. So <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, so you, you ask about union busting and the decertification elections. Um, yes, absolutely. In fact, I have, I found evidence. I found um, th there was a union buster named Shaw who uh, he put all his papers at the University of Virginia Law School and nobody had ever used them. And I got in there, he was out of Baltimore. And I got in there and, you know, he, he actually, they had evidence. He, he, there are memos of how he gave advice to employers how they could trigger decertification elections which is illegal um you can't do that uh you know uh but they did um and absolutely there was a wave of decertifications and i'm glad you brought that up um those um decertifications are not uh in like that chart that i showed those only show representation elections i made a decision not to put in the decertification, uh, uh, the decert elections. Um, so, uh, but but yes, there was a whole uh, 
wave of the union busters who would uh, force, force strikes basically um, and use that as a way to, to bust unions. There were handbooks, they had handbooks teaching people how to do this, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, that's an important part of the story. Um, so this question of the, again, the labor leadership and uh, the, whether it's a, uh, they were a product of the social compact and they were groomed by it. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, uh, that for many, in many cases, you know, that's true. Uh, what I want to do is draw attention to the parts of the labor movement, the people who are trying to push in, who are trying to gain access, and who were engaged in this mass massive battle with employers that for so long has been invisible. Now, you asked a question, Rick, about what happened to some of this opposition. And I just want to point out, we do have Dr. Naomi Williams is on the call today, and I know I don't know if Naomi wants to answer that, but that's her research. And Naomi's research is gonna answer that question. Um, so look for that. <laughs> I'm thrilled that she's here today. Um, and uh, Logan, let's see, this. Uh, uh, that's great. I'm excited to learn that you've been researching 1978, the right to work. I didn't know about this in Missouri. That's awesome. Um, you know, I think that honestly, I. I think that what happened is that this, the, the standard narrative was so strong that people didn't question it. That, you know, I often think about Jeff Cowie's book, where, which is, he's the one that staying alive, 1970s, last days of the working class. Um, people talk about the story that I'm giving as basically, you know, countering Jeff Cowie's, but in fact, really what he's doing is he's just building on the standard narrative. Um, and I think it was so strong and people accepted it so much uh, that they didn't look for the, for the other stories. And there's so many other stories. So this one that you're telling about Missouri, that sounds like a great one. I found like the Newport News story it's crazy that there was an election, the largest labor board election ever in the South, the largest one in the 1970s. And the only thing I could find was that Judith Stein has two pages and striking steel, striking America, uh, or no, running steel, running America is what that book is called. She has two pages on it. Um, you know, and I think it's because people were so sure of their story that they didn't look for the other stories that might counter it. And there's tons of them. I cherry picked labor board elections, but there's tons more uh, for people who, who want to research. Um, so I, that's great on your, your research and I look forward to seeing that. Um, so uh, Mike, I'm glad to know that you were at Solidarity Day. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, <laughs> there's a letter that George Meany uh, posted in the Wall Street Journal in 1979 after the defeat of labor law reform. Uh, there was a whole labor law reform bill that went through the House in 77. It was defeated in the Senate uh, and a filibuster in 1978. And the AFL-CIO, it was, uh, I think, um, I think they were really, that the, much of the labor movement was, was really caught flat footed and were amazed that the employers would fight that viciously. But the employers no longer saw a place for collective bargaining, um, you know, as, as part of the social compact, basically. Um, and that was, was new and unexpected for them. And I think that they didn't know how to react. Um, you know, and uh, we saw the results of that through the 1980s and beyond. Um, I think that the early 80s are really, really the low period. I think by the late 80s into the 90s, 
that labor starts to um, experiment with some new programs, some new uh, ways of, of trying to fight back. So, you know, I mentioned before justice for janitors, jobs with justice. This is when they begin the shareholder campaigns. Um, you know, you eventually see the kind of organizing like the home health care workers in California where entire groups of people are reclassified so they can be part of, of a union. So there's there's a whole different movement in the starting in the late 80s and the 90s and beyond. But by the early 80s, that old system, they were definitely caught flat footed and didn't know how to move. All right. Um, well, we nobody yet has sort of um, entered the queue or the uh, the stack to ask a question. Uh, again, I would invite you to do so. This is the opportunity to do it. I'm wondering. I don't want to put her on the spot if Naomi does want to take up <laughs> Lane's invitation. Naomi, with her own connection to UW. Um, anybody? Um, okay, Naomi says she needs the question again. Oh, well, it's just the idea uh, Rick was talking about sort of, you know, there were all these sort of uh, opposition movements in the 1980s, lots of struggles among um, people of color, sort of left opposition movements uh, in the 70s and 80s, and sort of what happened to all of that, um, what happened to some of that opposition. Uh, if you want to um, take her up on that, Naomi, I've unmute, I've asked you to unmute, and you can activate your camera. Hi, <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, don't feel on the spot at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine. And you know, so my research really looks at what was happening in Racine and Kenosha, Wisconsin during that time period, and really, you know. It, there are lots of labor activists, union members, and um, people fighting for economic justice who were fighting the fight and doing, you know, doing the work, and they just didn't have the support of the Democratic Party. You know, they would elect officials, and it was really for me, you know, going through the archives just to see the um, frustration that people felt. They're like, <laughs> you know, hey, we're doing all of this work, and we're we're just not being listened to, and people are turning their backs. On us, and it's this it's the same kind of sense that I feel now, right? In this current moment, when so many activists are, you know, going out and supporting their candidates and pushing for reforms and pushing for, you know, radical ad adjustments to what's happening and getting, you know, lackluster response and and getting, you know, centrist <laughs> let's let's make friends kind of um, attitudes, and and that really gets in the way of working class activism, and that's what keeps people from the polls in my opinion, right? And um, it's just so much of it is a disservice to the work that working class activists are doing right now. So, you know, I wouldn't, I, let me just say that I think that workers are doing a lot of work that goes um, unanswered in the um, political economy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know, if, Lane, if you want to uh, carry on that conversation, because um, currently there's no one else who's raising a, their hand or indicating they have a question or comment. Well, maybe what I'll do is just talk a little bit about um, and what I am going to talk about a little bit more tomorrow. I think that, the, that one of the reasons it's so important to have this new historical narrative is that once we understand that there was a diversified working class who fought for full access, who wanted to be part of unions, then it makes much more sense when we understand like what Naomi's talking about today, that there remains uh, uh, a big push uh, among working people, uh, both for unions and for power and rights in a larger sense. I like to talk today about the workers movement uh, and I understand the workers' movement to include both organizations that are based on collective bargaining, like labor unions, as well as the entire gamut of organizations that build workers' power in other ways. 
uh, outside collective bargaining. So these are groups like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, the National Taxi Workers Alliance, the National Guest Workers Alliance. There's a whole, and all the campaigns for, uh, you know, raising the minimum wage, the fight for 15. Uh, that coupled with, there's a, a, a large interest in unions and union organizing right now. We look at the Red for Ed movement. There were more strikes in, in 2018 and 2019 than we've seen since 1983. Uh, you, you see a big push for unions among young people, especially um, like tech writers, te the tech journalists, as well as um, university employees, young people. Uh, Gallup polling right now shows that Unions' ap approval ratings are very high. They're at 65 percent. Young people, it's even higher, right? Um, you know, and people would like to form unions. It's just so dang hard to do all the things you have to do to to win a union. Um, so anyway, I see. I'm actually very hopeful about this moment because I see lots of energy. Uh, among activists of all stripes and all kinds of organizations. And it, it does not show up in those Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, numbers. You know, they, they, those statistics every year show whatever. You know, I gave them 6.3% union membership in the private sector, 11%, whatever it is in the, you know, total. Um, but that's only for people who are actually covered by collective bargaining. It doesn't include the fight for 15 activists. It doesn't include the domestic workers. It doesn't include the guest workers. It doesn't include all these other people who are active in other ways. And I see today that we have to talk about um, a workers movement and it is mostly led by people of color and women uh, and I'll, I'll just make a quick plug, which is that one of my roles is that I am um, the uh, co-director of a group called um, Will Empower Women Innovating Labor Leadership. And we, uh, we uh, do apprenticeships and trainings uh, and events, all building a new generation of women's labor leadership. Uh, and I do think that women are at the forefront of this, of this workers movement today. Um, and so if anybody's interested, you can check out uh, Will Empower and learn more about that. Very cool. Um, so folks, we still have some time if anybody wants to jump in here with a question or comment. Um, currently, no one's in the stack, either through um, <clears throat> raising your hand or the chat function. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Time to make history. <laughs> Is there anybody else oh, here, who is part yeah, of Solidarity I, uh, Day too? I have a question here from someone. Um, from Aldo Laudia Santiago, I'm gonna ask you to, or go ahead, you're unmuted and your camera's Hi up. there. Hi. Thanks. Um, I have a question about uh, whether you would um, extend that argument to include New York City. And, and I know that the standard narrative for New York City is what you described, uh, perhaps mostly through Freeman's book. Um, the aspect of New York that is an intense urban crisis where everybody got hit, including public sector employment that in other contexts might have been going up, but in New York it declined and entered in crisis. And that's a narrative of mid, mid to late 70s. Would you alter your claim for New York or would you kind of do a revisionism there as well? Should I go ahead and take that or do we have others? Question, which is um, fairly brief, which is from Gus and Joanne, how about the sports players, football, basketball? Mm -hmm. um, so athlete, professional athletes, I assume. Yeah. So why don't you tackle those two? Okay, so uh, the question on New York City is a great one. And I would highly recommend Kim Philip Fine's book, which I'm not remembering the name, 
if anybody can remember the name of her book about New York, the most recent one, put it in the chat because I can't remember the title. <laughs> Somebody will probably be able to remember it. Um, yeah. You can do that, okay. <laughs> um, so what Kim Phillips Fine argues in that book is that yes, in New York City, you had uh, one of the uh, you know most advanced versions of sort of a democratic um, uh, social compact, like the 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 one that uh, you had this the state and the city. Fear City, that's what it's called, Fear City, <laughs> and New York's fiscal crisis and the rise of austerity politics. Uh, and, and so she, what she does, it, and it's really great because she talks about what was happening at the high level. So we hear about the bankers who um, made a decision to push for austerity uh, and um, their relationships with the elected leaders. But then we also see the push from the bottom. We see the union activists. We see the, the uh, firefighters who take over the firehouse and live in it with their families and do like uh, polka night <laughs> in the firehouse while they're, they are basically doing a sit-in to protest cuts to the firehouse. We see students sitting in in the universities. There's a massive fight back at the grassroots level while the there is a concerted effort by the bankers basically to uh, influence the, uh, and they the bankers win to basically influence austerity. Um, so, um, you know, what I see is that yes, that the narrative does hold in New York. It's just that New York was so much more heavily unionized uh, and um, you know, uh, that, that a, there a lot of the fight isn't just like in union elections, it's also uh, in the public sector and around these issues of austerity. So Kim Phillips Fine, Fear City, I recommend that. Um, so sports players, I don't, I don't remember on NBA, but the football players, actually, I found records of the football players. They actually voted in labor board elections during the 1970s. Um, there was a time when they, I think, uh, were um, uh, reass reasserting. They, I think they had already had like some kind of a players association, but they turned it into an official union and they went through the labor board process and won their election that way. Um, I, I actually don't know about the basketball players. So somebody else might know their history a little bit better, but I do know that it was in the seventies that the NFL um, solidified their, their organization through the labor board elections. And the key thing about that is that the person who was the head of that, which who initiated something rather significant was Ed Garvey, who was a Wisconsinite and res resident of Madison who ran for governor a couple of times whose proposal was for profit sharing actually. But that it, the compromise that came out of that was um, free agency. And that's how free agency came about. Um, anyway, um, so we are out of time. It's now 5.30 and I wanna thank you very much for what was really a stimulating presentation and also conversation. And this is just part one of a two part series uh, for Elaine because tomorrow I wanna remind everybody that her second talk, which is at 4 p.m. Central, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern, is Workers' Control in Gig America, a discussion on the 21st century labor movement. And if you haven't already registered for that, please do so and encourage your friends, family, and colleagues to do as well. So once again, Lane, thanks so much for this. And we really are looking forward to tomorrow's talk. Thank you. I appreciate it and thank you everybody uh, for coming. I look forward to seeing you.